But some of you know me, have been graced by having me in class, and some of you do not. So I, my name is Amy Gannon. I am a professor here at the School of Business, and I teach organizational behavior, both at the undergrad and the graduate level, which is really how people behave in organizations. And I also direct the internship program and the undergrad program, and I teach in the undergrad capstone course, which is really an entrepreneurship-based experience. Um, so Amy asked me to come today because you are working in teams in this class, and to do a refresher for some of you around the ideas of team development and conflict and feedback. And some of you, this might be new ideas. So I'm going to talk about the team development and their stages that teams go through in terms of their development. Talk a little bit about different conflict management styles that we have and um, how that shapes how we interact with others. And a little bit about feedback, giving and receiving feedback. Because my understanding is you're going to do that after e going forward you're going to do that after every uh, at the end of every class session is to give feedback and have a check in. Sound good? Okay. So some of you remember, I, sometimes I can't think without a marker in my hand, and um, there's theory on team development that there are five stages. I just put these boxes on the board. And when we talk about team development, we're talking about the team and the team's evolution, not necessarily task accomplishment. We're talking about how do people feel about being a member of that team and what is the identity um, and the processes of the team working together. So you could deliver a project at any stage in the team's development. So the first stage of team development is, who remembers? Lindsay, you remember, right? Right? Yes. Yes. So the first stage of team development is forming. In the forming, we have somebody who wants to join us here. In the forming stage, this is when you first discover you're going to be in a team. You've assigned to work, your boss has said, oh, you got to go work on this team over here. Your professor has told you you need to work on a team. You're in the church and you're going to form a team with your fellow church members to produce something or create something. When you first form, there's a series of questions that go through your mind. You may not speak them out loud often, but there's a series of questions that go in your thinking. What, do you th what are you thinking when a team first forms? I hope they're cool. I hope they're cool. <laughs> I hope they think I'm cool. Who's going to be in charge? How is this dynamic going to go? What role do I play? What work will I do? A whole series of questions because at that point things are unknown on that team. Sometimes you're on a team that you've worked with a few other people before, but you quickly, many of you have probably experienced, even if you have a few of the same people, the chemistry on a team is very different depending on the set of people that are there. So in the forming stages, you're thinking about what's up, what's going to happen on this team, and you, you and in this stage, I suggest that you are doing nicey nice, right? Because you don't know the lay of the land yet, you don't know who these people are, so you want to make a good impression so everybody's sort of on good behavior when we first form a team. Then something happens. What's the next box, Lindsay? Oh, man. OK. Storming. Excellent. Storming. She's a migrant. Yes, my team member knows what's going on. <laughs> storming. So what, Sarah, what happens in storming? Everything blows up. Everything kind of blows up, right? People start to get on your nerves. You figure out which of your team members are not cool. Who has the habit? If Amy does that one more time, they're going to lose my mind, right? People start to take, there's a co control and a power. Whose decision, how are we making decisions and whose decision really counts? Who's, who, who has authority here? 
and we start to experience some tensions. Totally natural in team development. Experience some tensions, experiencing some tugging and pulling, experiencing some frustration with fellow teammates, re-challenging and not necessarily everybody worried about first good impression, but actually starting to worry about how are we gonna get work done and how is this gonna play out. Totally normal. Next stage, norming, right? When, if we can get past this, we start to develop some rhythms. You start to develop some norms. People start to fall into the roles that they're gonna play on this team. And people play different roles. On, you may play one role on one team and come into another team and you play kind of a different role because of the chemistry of that team and the, and the people that are on it. So getting through storming, you start to settle down a little bit. And then the next stage you reach is performing. So who has had an experience when you've been on a really, really awesome team, right? What is it like when you're on a really, really awesome team? He does all the work. He does all the work. <laughs> <laughs> What's it feel Everybody like? Everybody knows their role and, and their adept at, at performing in their perspective role. Yeah, so people know what they're supposed to do and they're doing well at it. And the intersection of my work and your work is, seems almost seamless. There's a rhythm to that, and a, I can almost think what the other person is going to think. Amy and I are actually on the team, and we were talking the other day, and we were like, oh, Melody's going to... We knew exactly how Melody was going to react to something when we told her about it, because we have, we are, I, I, would, I, would, I feel we've reached a high-performing stage. You can finish each other's sentences. You're in the zone, in the zone. That's a great place and it is energizing and it feeds you and it sustains the team when you can reach that. Many, 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 many teams never get to this point. As a team, they do not coalesce enough as a unit, collective unit, to get to this point. So this last phase is adjourning. And that means ending. And sometimes you're quite glad when the team ends and sometimes you're not. If you've actually gotten to this stage of feeling you have a really high performing team, you're typically having a lot of fun with that team. And to reach a point of saying goodbye to that team because for whatever reason it's ending can be um, a very painful process. And I have this phrase that it's easier to be mad than sad and that's true of not just teams, but it just is more comfortable to sit with anger than it is to sit with sadness. And so it's not uncommon for a high performing teams when they know it's about to end to start doing things that bug each other. Because it's easier to be mad than be sad. And having that parting that ways can be, can be painful. So do not be surprised if a team that they just clicking, clicking, what happened? At the end, what happened? Don't be surprised at some behaviors that, are surpri that may surprise you, but that aren't what you would think about in this adjourning. Easier to be mad than sad. And I would suggest that if you find people are frustrated with you or frustrated about something or feeling really anger, step back for a moment and say, is this anger really an expression of sadness about something? And because then we can kind of deal with that. Sometimes it's not, but it's, it's easier to be mad than sad. So what I think is critical, I think a lot of teams get this forming kind of down and then they get here and they get stuck. They don't know what to do with this. Sometimes we don't invest enough time in each other in the advance. Let's just get to a task. There are things you do on a team that are task issues, like how are we going to do this project, what our deliverable is, and there are maintenance issues about how are we interacting and engaging with each other as a team. And both of those are critical. If you don't pay, and, and I think there's a tendency not to pay attention to the maintenance issues and not to invest up front. And investing means 
to, to really get here, people who are here often know each other beyond the task and see each other not just as fellow workers on this project, but um, friends and colleagues. I know you as a human being, not just somebody who's doing work with me. And you can, some investment up here to acknowledge each other as human beings in that forming stage. I always suggest the teams do something that's not in the context of work. Go get a drink together, go have lunch together, and get outside that setting when you're initially forming a team. It's really powerful because you start to say, we're human beings together. And then when you get to the storming, because you will, and it takes different forms, because you're seeing each other as human beings and you're knowing things about each other, you might be able to navigate this a little better. But storming is critical. Why is it important? You cannot get here. You cannot, do you see? It, it, it's not outside of the line. You cannot get here in this performing spot if you haven't gone through storming. Why is that? What, do, what purpose does storming serve? Sarah? Well, it allows you to determine how you'll handle conflict with each other. Mm -hmm. This whole thing is sort of like dating or <laughs> being in a relationship. Mm -hmm. You have to move through the phases of learning how to be in a relationship with someone or each other. Mm -hmm. And it can't be really, really great until it's kind of bad. Until it's kind of bad. So. It is exactly like a relation, well not exactly, that's a little bit, but it is a relationship. That's, that a team by definition is about relationships with other people, right? It, I always suggest to people, how many have had a fight with their spouse, their parents, their friends, their children, right? We fight with people all the time that we love and care about. And we learn through that relationship. I always suggest if you haven't had a fight with your girlfriend, you're not in a relationship yet. You haven't even gotten to that status, relationship status, because you haven't fought and then gotten through that fight and that argument. You can't really be a team until you guys have argued it may be about the topic, it may be about debating the issues, it may be, yeah, we've gotten on each other's nerves about something, and we walked away going, <clears throat> and then we came back, and we're okay. And when you come back and you're okay, it builds trust, it reduces the fear of disagreeing with each other because you know you're going to come out the other side. If you're not sure if you're going to come out, this relationship is going to come out the other side if you disagree, there's a problem. You, won't, you will choose not to disagree in an effort to protect that relationship. And on a team, if you're not disagreeing about some stuff, you're not actually getting to good ideas. You can't get to good ideas unless you're debating it and disagreeing it with it. And we'll have on our team, this particular team I'm thinking about, well, this is the response I'll sometimes get, Amy, I'm not really th I don't really think of it that way. Okay, so how do you think of it? <laughs> or, well, I might come at it a different way. Okay, how would you come at it? Tell, tell me. And there's a way of disagreeing and having a different, and, and we may not come to the same conclusion, but we come to a solution that we're gonna move forward with as a team. Storming is critical, it builds trust, it builds depth on your team, and it builds your capacity to have disagreement. Teams that cannot have disagreement are never going to be in this stage. They will never ever get there. It's just not possible to be really high performing and be a high quality team without being able to disagree with each other and express that disagreement. It just doesn't work. So, storming. How many in here would qualify themselves as experts at navigating conflict. Okay, Dennis. Okay. No one's an expert on navigating conflict. We'll talk. No one is. 
And we all have tendencies in how we're going to manage conflict. Now, tendencies are just our comfort space. Right, it doesn't mean we can't manage conflict in multiple ways, but we all have that space where we have, our, what's, what's our natural, like you're right-handed or left-handed? You have it, and that's, you didn't decide that. It just happened, right? So you have a natural tendency on how you manage conflict. And there's a model of conflict management and I was gonna, I, I can, I was gonna give you handouts, and I can um, give Amy these, and you can have them for reference later. Um, well, let, me, let me put this on the board so you can see it. So this model looks at how um, assertive or cooperative am I in measures of if I'm high, am I high assertive, low assertive, low cooperative, or, or high cooperative. Assertiveness is a paying attention to your own interests. If I'm highly assertive, I am articulating what matters to me and I'm asserting, we're not talking about aggressiveness necessarily, we're talking about assertiveness, right? Cooperativeness is about how in tune and attentive am I to the other person's interests and needs, okay? So if we are low, low, we call this where I'm not really paying attention to mine or acting on mine and I'm not really paying attention to yours, what am I, probably doing avoiding, avoiding. <laughs> I just I this is just not happening and I and I've got to go to the bathroom this is usually a strategy you, you'll find somebody who will not engage they've got some I, I've got to be somewhere I'm sorry I gotta leave bye right they will disengage completely from conflict we all anybody in here that that's your natural tendency no one wants to Okay, so avoiding. I'm sure we have one in here. It's okay. You avoid conflict with your mother? Sure. Okay. Well, <laughs> avoid. <laughs> avoid any interaction with my mother, then we have no conflict. Right. So if we are our low assertiveness, and high cooperativeness, what are we usually doing? We're in, a, we're in a, a, a back and forth here trying to decide something, and I'm low assertive, high cooperative. What do you think I'm, I have a tendency to do? Roll over. Roll over. Okay, yield. <laughs> yeah, but that's what it is. To accommodate the other person. Okay. And in the mid-range, we'll talk about it in a minute, but in the mid-range, we have compromise. We'll just meet in the middle. Up here, okay. I know what I want, and I'm going to get it, and I don't really, I'm not very concerned about what you want. We call this forcing. I force my way to get what I want. Up here is sort of the ideal space, right? Because I'm highly assertive, clear about what I want, and I'm highly attentive to what you want. And I am engaged in a way that says, how do we get both? How do we get both? And so it's a problem solving. Now, I said that's ideal, and generally. None of, there's nothing inherently bad about any of these strategies. I mean, we have our tendency. We, we, we will, if I'm an avoider and I get really feeling threatened, I'm gonna come here even though I'm capable of using these other strategies. But there are instances when it makes sense to avoid. When would be an instance that it makes sense? 
to check out completely from that interaction. Okay, when the decision isn't crucial and the other person is extremely emotional about the subject. So, so we, how many have been in a conversation where it starts to get, all of a sudden you're, somebody's getting really heated about it? Or you might be getting really heated about it and you're starting to say things that you know you shouldn't be saying? Like, I, that just came out of my mouth and now I'm even madder. Check it out. Pull away. I can't, I cannot do this right now or if it, the other person is getting escalated, not, we can't have this conversation right now. We need to walk away from this and just leave it. Leave it. Now, if you're avoiding in other scenarios, it can cause a lot of problems, right? You can't get anything done if somebody will not engage around the issue that you need to engage. But there are instances when avoiding makes sense. What about yielding? What would be an instance when yielding makes sense? When it benefits you more to do so. When it benefits you more. So you may be, you have a particular opinion about something, but you know what? This really doesn't matter that much to me. Actually, in the grand, you know, kind of that pick your battles kind of thing. I have an opinion about this, but you know what? It really matters to Lindsay more than it matters to me. So this is a time when I, I will yield to Lindsay on this one. And I'm good with that. And I actually demonstrate that at other times, you may want to yield to me. So when it's not a high priority for you, let, it's a, it's a, don't keep fighting for it. It's really not worth the energy. And you really give somebody else some value by yielding to them. When would forcing make sense? Sarah. An ethical issue or an area where you're just not willing to compromise, like in accounting, say if you know something's fraudulent or mm -hmm. corrupt or wrong, and you just say, I won't. Yeah, there is, there is no way I'm moving off of this. We can try to problem solve over here, potentially, but there's a, this is a situation where I will not budge on this one. Other things I'll budge, but this one is non-negotiable for me, and I'm going to stay with it. Sometimes people have trouble <laughs> what's really non-negotiable and what's not. But there are instances like ethical situations. Also, there may be situations where You've got to make a, dis the, a really hard decision has to be made, and it has to be made now, and we're not going to talk about it. Sometimes if there are safety issues, if there are other scenarios where it is not, it, we're doing this thing now, and I have to make the choice. So there are instances where this makes sense. Compromise, you know, a lot of people say how, celebrate how great compromise is. But I have a little trouble with compromise a lot of times. The downside of it is nobody gets actually what they want. Right? Everybody gets half of That's something. Said. <laughs> <laughs> one person gets everything and the other person gets <laughs> Well, this way we try to move to here. We try to be creative. But compromise, and people tend to compromise because they think the pie is this big and we need to cut it. So let's just cut it in half when sometimes that's not really the case. You actually, if you put a little energy into it and you actually engage in the discussion, we might actually create something even better and, and, and create options that we couldn't even see at first. And that's what this is. Let's problem solve in such a way that we get to the place where both of us are being heard and being incorporated into that decision. Now, this is like, you know, if, I, if, I, if, I, if you're right-handed and I said, for whatever reason, your, your whole hand is in a cast and you cannot use your right hand, you would use your left. It would feel weird. Over time, you would get better at it. It would become a little more natural. It's never going to feel like it does with your right hand, but you can get better at it. Wherever your tendency is, you develop the skill in the other areas. And really being good at navigating conflict means being able to read a situation and adapt your 
um, interaction based on the situation, based on what's needed in that moment. What happens when we have one of these, oops, yielders on, because there's one thing about your style and then if you're on a team, there's a whole set of styles, right? So your style depends in some ways on other people's tendency and style. You get one of those and one of those on a team. Right? This person is going to, I'll tell you, they're going to yield and yield and yield and yield and then explode. They will lose it at some point. And this person will say, what? I don't know why you're so upset. We're doing great because this person's getting everything they want, right? So in this kind of scenario, because this I think is where it gets really toxic, this interaction here. If your tendency is to yield, you need to speak up. And you need to speak up early and not wait until you totally lose your mind. Because you're holding it in. You've got a list. This one and this one and then she did that and then she did this and it's gonna come out. So let's just talk about them one by one, <laughs> right? Let's just not hold it up. If you're in this style, you gotta know that people are holding stuff in. You've gotta know it and be aware of it and try to pull that out and try to back yourself off. Because this, this can be, because other people become observers of this interaction, right? They know it's brewing and then they will just try to check out from that. Ooh. So when we think about it, you're gonna have, we just said, right? Every team is gonna have some kind of conflict. And this applies to your teams here, it applies to your teams at work. You're gonna, ha you're gonna have that tension. Watch and observe your own behaviors, watch and observe the tendencies of the people on your team, and try to navigate and see how, what are the interactions that are happening? What is my tendency with conflict? Most people have a sick feeling in their stomach when they think they have to deal with conflict. They get this, right? You know what I'm talking about. Oh, I'm gonna have to have this difficult conversation and I don't know what they're gonna say and I don't know how I'm gonna feel and oh, our boss called us into his office and oh, is he mad at our team, right? Am I the only person that knows that feeling? Okay. So part of what helps in managing conflict and being productive, there's, when we look at conflict, oh, I wanna put low. Actually, and, and value, impact, right? The impact of conflict on a perf team's performance. If it's too low, it has an, it, it's problematic. There's value up here. This is sort of neutral. If it's too low, it's problematic. Why? Which kind of talks about this, right? If it's too low. If a team has no level of conflict or disagreement or um, debate and that potential thing, what's the problem with that? They don't care. They have not invested enough, right? I'm not really, I'm not really putting my ideas out there and I'm not really challenging anybody else's ideas. I'm not pushing this, I don't feel any passion about this thing or I choose not to because I, I'm in that bucket. If it's too high, what happens? Everything's explosive. People don't need, oh, I've got to go to this meeting again, oh, right? You can't get any work done because everybody's just mad at each other. So somewhere in the middle here is where it's most productive. This is productive conflict in here. And primarily substantive conflict. Debate about the substance of the work we're doing and not necessarily emotional conflict. So part of what 
is going to help navigate conflict in teams is the ability to give each other feedback. I, I think in the workplace, the inability to deal with conflict and the inability to give high quality feedback is the source of many, 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 many problems. They may manifest themselves as other things, but if we got to the root of it, this is why we don't function well in organizations. I feel really strongly about that. All of us have blind spots. So there's a theory called Johari's window. And in the window, it's a box, more boxes. In the window, there are things we know about ourselves and things other people know about us, and that's our public. That's in the public space. Everybody knows. We, Amy knows who I am. I know who I am. Like, I know it about myself. I even said, I'm gonna, right? There's things we know about ourselves and other, that's the public space. There are things that we know about ourselves, but really other people don't know about them and we don't really share them. That's our, our private space. There are things that we're just not even conscious of about ourselves that are going on and we don't know what's going on and nobody else knows what's going on, but it's going on. That's just the hidden. It's, it's hidden from ourselves. It's hidden from other people. Not that there's not things going on, but we just don't know about them. And then there's this box of things that other people know about us, but we don't know about ourselves. That's our blind spot. That's, you have had friends, colleagues, why does she keep doing that? And you all know she does it every time you go out to lunch. She, and she's, she's completely clueless about it, right? She does not know that she's doing this. That, that's her blind spot because you know it, but she doesn't. All of us have blind spots. The goal is to create an environment where people can give us feedback and help us shrink that blind spot. Because you do not want particularly unproductive behaviors, keep doing them and not realize you're doing them. You will keep doing things and you'll be confused about why people always react or why it's, what's happening, why you're getting that response. We want to shrink our blind spot, but the, really the only way we can do that effectively is to be open to receiving feedback and go seek it. To seek out feedback as often as we can, even if we're nervous about getting it. So giving and receiving feedback, both are skills. The ability to give feedback and the ability to take in feedback that you, you receive and process that is a skill. When we give feedback, we want to focus on behavior. You really want to focus on specific behavior. Sometimes if we're over here in this space, right, this negative conflict, too much conflict, it's hard to focus on behavior. She's just annoying. Stop being annoying. What am I supposed to do? What, what do I do that's annoying? I, how can I just stop being annoying, right? He's lazy. He doesn't ever do any work. And we start to attribute to the per as a trait of the person rather than behavior. But when we give, back, give feedback to people, we want to focus on the behavior, the consequence of that behavior. When you don't come to our meetings, we can't make decisions and move forward. You hold up the whole team and our progress. So we really need you to come to meetings. When you don't respond to email, we don't know that you, it, it signals to us that you're not, um, a, our project's not a priority to you. Which causes a problem in terms of our morale about being excited about the project. When you send out the task items and it's organized and it's clear and it's timely, that's awesome because then we can move forward. We actually are really productive. When we come back to a meeting, we've actually accomplished things in between the meetings. That's great that you do that. The behavior and the result of the behavior. And when you give feedback, you really want to be a in a place of good intention. And if you're not 
Ugh, not fully in a place of good intention, it can be problematic trying to give feedback. Sometimes it's hard because you haven't navigated the conflict that's happened, or there's tension, and you're in this kind of space over here to really come with good intentions, but you've got to kind of clean away that baggage as much as you can and say, I really want this person to be better at this. I really want to recognize this person for the things that they do really well. So coming with good intention, focusing on behaviors and the outcomes of those behaviors, and then how you can support. Receiving feedback, I always say, because you know, you're going to get feedback and you go in and you're a little nervous. Assume best intention and don't take a stance of any buts, becauses, or let me tell yous. What is a but, because, or let me, why do I say that? We have a tendency to what? Make excuses. Make excuses? To rationalize? And when we do that, often what happens to the person who is trying, if we assume good intent, trying to give you feedback about what potentially could be a blind spot, or it may not even be in your blind spot. What does it do to that person's feedback that they're giving you? You discount it. You minimize it. The person has made the effort. And even if you don't agree, the person is trying to tell you what they understand from their vantage point. Sometimes more effectively or less effectively. But when you go, but, mm, well, that's because, and you don't listen, you're minimizing the other person in their effort. So no buts, becauses, or let me tell you. When you're getting feedback, you can ask questions because you want to clarify. So we have this active listening. Active listening, people say, it means nodding. <laughs> no, it means actually helping the person tell you what they want to tell you. Helping a person say what they mean. Sometimes words come out of our mouths and it's not actually what we mean. Who's had that? Nah, well, that's not really what I mean. And the per if you have a person on the other side says, is it like this? Or do you mean like that? And they hear you? Yes, 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 that's what I mean. How good does that feel, right? So when you're getting feedback, your job is to make sure you understand what that person is trying to tell you. And you're helping them tell. So ask for clarification. And often once you've kind of gotten the feedback to repeat back what you think you heard, this is what I think you heard, I heard, as best you can, because sometimes, sometimes you're joyous. So I, oh, yes. And I'll, I can guarantee, human nature, I can guarantee, you got 10 things of things you do awesome, and two things of improvement. Which ones are you gonna focus on? The two. When somebody repeats back to you what you told them, I can, I can almost, I'll put money on the table. They're gonna, well, I need to get better at, I need to get better at. And then your job is to say, you also, remember, you also do well at these things. That's true. And remember this too, because we, we all do it. Focus on that constructive piece. So giving and receiving feedback, it's not easy, but you're gonna be doing that in this class. You do it in your workplaces. You do it in your families. You do it with your mom or not, right? <laughs> right, we're always doing this. We ha when you're in relationship, there's opportunity to give feedback to another person. So finding ways to give and receive feedback, I'm convinced this is a huge factor in the workplace and if we could figure this out, wow, right? So, in this class, you have a, you're gonna get a, have they already gotten their form that they're gonna yeah. practice filling out? So when you're giving and receiving feedback, I've talked with Amy about this, that you need to make sure you have enough time. So in the Army, there is a thing, who, who's heard of, in the Army, they do this, what they call an after action review, right? And that's what you're really gonna, you're gonna do some version of an after action review. You're gonna come to class, you're gonna, you have, you have to, you're gonna, my understanding of your simulation, simulation is you're gonna make decisions pretty quickly. And you're gonna have to debate those decisions, come to some agreement on how you're gonna move forward. And when you do that, there's none of this 
Well, if you had listened to me, we wouldn't have this problem now. I do it with my husband all the time, and I know better, but I still do. Well, I don't want to tell you I told you so. I'm essentially telling him I told him so, right? So none of that business. But you're going to have intense decisions to make. It's going to be fun, and it's going to be exciting. At the end of that, you're going to have an after-action review. How do we do? How do we do? And you're going to give feedback to each other and also process not only how do we do individually, but how do we do as a unit, as a collective. That's really powerful that you're going to have this experience because if we did this more in the workplace, and we kind of, on our high-performing team, we, any, we don't do it with every meeting, but every time we have some deliverable, we facilitated some workshop, we say, okay, when are we going to debrief? We almost want to do it immediately, and often we can because of logistical constraints. But as soon as possible after that thing, what went well, what didn't go well, what could I have done differently, what could we have rearranged, and we do this after action. So where are we going to go, given that knowledge? If we didn't do that and just floated to the next thing, we would not improve. We would not make solid decisions. So you have this great opportunity in this class to experience this after action review process. Feed, how did we do? How did it go? How did each of us do individually? How did we do collectively? And what are we going to do different when we come back next week? That, the more you invest in that process, that after action review, the better your experience is going to be. And that is true, you know, we, we, we do things in the classroom that all apply. They all apply in other. So when you think about other team projects you're doing, where do you have after action review? At what points does that make sense? Where, at what points do you give feedback to each other? When do you open space for that kind of conversation? Often it's not, often. And often, so um, part of giving that feedback, the, um, I guess the, this will be the last thing I talk about, and then we can ask questions if we want, but thanking people for the work that they do is incredibly powerful. And we've talked a lot about how to handle when somebody's not performing or when the expectations aren't being met or there's a problem. Giving, we assume people no, we appreciate them. We do it all the time. If you operate under the assumption that unless I tell them on a regular basis that I appreciate what they do, unless I tell them, wow, you really kicked it on that one. That was awesome. We, I should assume they don't necessarily know that and they need to hear it. People love when you see them. And part of all this problem is when I don't feel seen. If I don't feel seen as a human being, bringing my talents and energies to this interaction, bringing my love and passion and whatever else, I am not going to perform my best. I'm not going to feel as committed. See the people you work with. Acknowledge them. Value them and tell them you do. It will go a long, 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 long way. So, okay. I'm done. Do we have, is that camera still on? Okay, do we have questions? <laughs> I was gonna say at the beginning, you know, the camera's on, I'm gonna be weirder than weird now, but any questions or any, I know I kind of threw a lot. Yes. One thing we have talked about before is all this investment into a team might not always happen. We might have groups. Versus yep. Teams, and I think that might be kind of helpful for them to understand. When are we in a group and when are we a team? Yeah, so when we, if we think back about the stages of team development, often you're put in a work, there's no time for that. Like there's, there, you're just not going to be in a group long. It takes a certain period of time and investment to really be a team. And we often call everybody a team. You're, you're three people and you're working for an hour. You're a team. No, you're a group. You're not a team. You don't qualify as a team until you have some investment over a period of time and can evolve into a team. Really, your work, and work groups can be high functioning. You can get a lot accomplished in a work group, but it's different than a team. 
And so if we have expectations that people are going to be a team, we need to give them the time and, and, and ability to invest in themselves as a team. You need to get to know each other as a team. So in your mind, and, and it's helpful in my mind to distinguish group from team. Work group is short, deliverable. We're not really evolving over a developmental stage. We're not creating an identity as a team. It's, it's sort of a drop fast thing is how I think about it. When you're working on a longer project over time and that team element matters, you may not get to any conflict if you're just executing on your task. That's, you're not developing a, an identity there, but team, it, it requires more. So I think in terms of classrooms and in terms of workplaces, when we distinguish group from team, it ch changes our expectations and we use vocabulary a little better. I mean, they're just words, but that there's a lot behind the words. Does that, yeah, yeah, I think that's, we call everything a team. And it's not, not everything's a team, really. So, 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 I'll, yeah, yeah. So, how many people don't agree on, like, on each other? For example, we're doing a project. Mm -hmm. Let's take an example of a simulation. Mm -hmm. And then we don't agree on something, maybe the figure or something. Well, you're going to have, there's a, dis this is just like the workplace. At some point, you're going to have to make a decision, right? So you need to make sure everybody's ideas are heard and debate those ideas. Say, this, what's the pros of this, this choice or this, and the cons, pros and cons of choices? Why are you coming at that way? If we make this decision, what are the three things that we think are going to happen down the road of that decision? And really hash that out. And then at some point, you've got to find a way to say, it's time to make a decision. Who's going to make the call this time? Right? And you, you could have, often there's some, one person in the real world who always makes the call. But you could rotate that. This time, I'm going to make the call. You, you know, Sarah could say, Lindsay, you're up this time. You know, we're not all agreeing on this. We've hashed it out. We know what the pros and cons are. Just make the call. And what the team has to do, like we talked about later, is not say, well, Lindsay. <laughs> right? <laughs> Way to go. I knew you made the wrong call. I knew it, I knew it, I knew it. You can't do that. And teams don't do that. If, you, if you've reached that performing space, teams will say, we had to make a call, Lindsay made it, and we moved on. And it was a, she, she ultimately made the call, but really we made the call together. Sometimes, this is what will happen. If a person doesn't feel heard, if their opinion of it hasn't been acknowledged, they will keep at it. And other people say, we've already been through this. We've already talked about this. Why do we keep talking about it again? Anybody had this experience, right? Of being either end of that. Either end of that. Making sure, I find that what often works is, Lindsay, <laughs> this is what I think you're saying to me. I hear you. I hear, I hear that and I can respect that vantage point. I'm, I think of it differently. I have a different perspective on it. <laughs> right? But Lindsay knows you just told me what I think because you've listened to me and you really heard what I'm saying. It's not, you're, you're not confused about what I'm saying. You're saying you disagree. But often we keep trying to convince, we will try to convince the other person. And in the effort to convince the other person that our, our opinion is right, we ignore what they're, we discount what they're saying. We can have a difference of opinion. And I can acknowledge all the reasons you think that and still have my own opinion. Acknowledgement that other person could come to a different conclusion doesn't minimize your own conclusion necessarily. When you're having a debate, if you feel like you're not being heard and you find yourself, man, why do I, well, they're not listening. How many times do I have to say this? I just said it 14 times, you're not listening. Pause, pause. Are you guys really hearing what I'm saying? Because I'm not sure you are. And that will signal to the other people on your team, 
Yes, yes, we are hearing. Is this what you mean? Yes. And then you have to, they heard what I said and I have to, I have to be okay that they've heard it. This is not a science. There's not a check these three boxes, then you can move to a decision. It's an art more than it is a science. Does that help? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Any other questions? I'm excited for you guys. You're gonna have a great time in this class. I hope you really enjoy the simulation. I wanna do it too. But. Okay. Well, thanks for letting me or share. Oh, yeah, yeah. For the forming part, say you have people that, that just don't get along and you're the manager that's trying to help them form, and you suggested meet outside of work, go out and have a drink together. Maybe that's not appropriate if you're the, the manager. What else do you suggest? outside of getting a drink and, and well it, it could be coffee it could you know you, coffee is always it's like the DMZ zone like you let's just get coffee and just caffeinate you everybody's so you could suggest why don't we all meet for coffee you could do some team building in terms of um, there are things I often um, when there's some conflict try to recognize it could be this, or it could be I have a tendency to be an extrovert and, an, and get them dialoguing over their patterns of behavior. So often if you do, I'm an extrovert and an introvert, and somebody's an introvert, there's potential, all kinds of potential for, for those different ways of thinking. So if you get them kind of di dialoguing about who they are, and then thinking about how does that apply as we form a team. And I often do that before I form teams of talking about where potential friction points can come based on traits. So I'm a, clearly an extrovert. I, I talk all the time. Introverts. <laughs> when is she gonna shut up? Does she ever think before these things come out of her mouth, right? The extrovert, do you have anything, we'll say to an introvert, do you have anything to add to this conversation? <laughs> We're having a conversation. I'm talking to the wall. Do you have anything to add? Right? Tension. But if we acknowledge it, that extrovert, I don't know what I think until I say it. I talk to my dog and it helps me. I've, I've been with my husband 20 years and I tell him, you don't even have to pay attention. I'm just pretending I'm talking to somebody human and live. So I'll tell you when you have to pay attention. Ah! <laughs> but if you don't acknowledge that, there's potential for tension, right? right? Somebody who's an intuitive thinker thinks about the big picture, is creative, sort of says, where, what's the big purpose and the meaning? And somebody who's a sensor is like, okay, what are we going to do? What's the, what's the step one, step two, step three? Potential for friction, right? Can you just come down to earth and get something done? How do you know you're doing the right things? We have to check in. We could be doing all the wrong things. What's the point of all these step one, two, three, four, and five? But if you realize, and so sometimes you can get a dialogue around people who are having some tension, and, and sometimes that just, wow, that's partly what's going on here. Sometimes it's not. So I don't know if that helps, but sort of creating some neutral space and creating some dialogue and creating some opportunity to um, think of who we are and not necessarily. So one method of avoiding any conflict is to focus on the task. We will talk about nothing but this task because I don't want to go anywhere else in this conversation. So it's, it's one mechanism, but if you get people engaged and talking to each other around, just find something, right? So that they relax a little bit and build some trust and begin to see each other, you might be able to, in that forming stage, get some people who, and, and sometimes there is a way, I, I think there's possibilities of people who have, just get on each other's nerves a lot, if they begin to recognize why that's happening, can actually turn into the greatest allies, potentially, not always, but right, <laughs> we all know that. 
But there's opportunities there when we recognize what's actually getting on our nerves if we shifted it around could be to our benefit and we can collaborate to make it our benefit. Sometimes you can get people. It's hard when you're putting people who already have a history of conflict. Is that the scenario? Yeah. Yeah. Just curious for ideas. Yeah. Anybody else have ideas about you pulling together this form this team they're forming? Food usually. Has. Food, yes, food. Even if people are in opposite poles and hate each other or whatever it is that you don't know the history or you don't care anymore, you have a potluck or you bring in food or you order lunch, everybody likes to mm -hmm. do it. And when you're around a table or eating together or going out for lunch together, people tend to, I find, revert to the social mechanism of table manners and let's have a conversation about something other than work and mm -hmm. sort of find a more common ground of who you are as a person. I think there's a human, I, I agree with you totally, I think there's a human instinct when we break bread together, when we share food together. I see those people bring in food and I want you to listen to them. <laughs> <laughs> there, is a, uh, there is an element of that. And, and I see it actually when teams start to move toward that performing, they will find as many occasions as they can to eat together. So if you invest in that up the front, let's just go eat. <laughs> Say one thing about bringing food in is if you, there's a lot of people with allergies, yeah. diets, and if you ignore them when you're bringing food in, you will create additional tensions. Yeah. So yeah. I've seen it here at Edgewood already. So. Yeah. I'm glad you bring that up because it, it, that's another example of not being seen and not being valued. Or avoiding. Or avoiding. Yeah. They will work around you, and again, it's forming your team. Yeah. Any other questions or comments or ideas? Okay. Well, thanks for having me, and good luck with your projects. <laughs>